Well, good afternoon. It is good to, thank you. So I will not mind at all if you talk back to me. I come from a context where it is common for when the word is preached and the people agree, they say amen, nice and loud and heartily. That will not affect me or offend me. In fact, it might encourage me if you are verbal today. I just want to just throw that out there to begin with. It is uh, a joy to be here with you. Um, The theme of our uh, seminar, our workshop, is enjoying the presence of God together. And I understand that this is the part of the, the worship leader's track. So if you are involved in uh, any aspect of leading worship at your church, whether that's singing or a musician, um, even pastors, can, can I just see you show of hands if you're involved in that? Okay, excellent, excellent. So, so in one sense, I'm, I'm hesitant to even, um, I'm hesitant about the phrase worship leader <laughs> because of what it implies. Um, oftentimes when we think of worship leader, we're only thinking of the singing aspect of the corporate gathering. But what we should understand is that Um, When God's people come together rightly in the name of Christ, corporately, all of it is worship, right? So the the prayers, that is worship. That's ascribing worth to God and dependence on God through prayer. The the preaching of the word, that's worship, right? Uh, So when we we say worship leader and only limit that to those who do in participate in the singing, I think that's a, that's a limited view of, um, of what worship is. But yet, yeah, this talk is for, for those who are involved in any way in your church in helping to uh, facilitate the um, singing of, of praises to, uh, for the, the people of, of God. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, Psalm 16. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to open there. And, and we'll see if we can take some principles from uh, this psalm to, to help as we think through enjoying the presence of God together. Psalm 16, and I'll read beginning at verse 1. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. This is God's Word. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, which is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Our Father, we pray that you would magnify your name as your word is proclaimed. And we pray that you would help us to understand in deeper ways what it means to enjoy the presence of God together. So Lord, we ask in this time that the Spirit of God would use the Word of God to reveal the Son of God for our joy and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So what does it mean for God to be present 
as we gather for corporate worship. Because on one hand, God is omnipresent. Nothing in all creation is hidden from the eyes of him to whom we must give account, Hebrews 4.13. On the other hand, there's a sense in which God is more present in some places than in others. So under the old covenant, God was more present in Israel than he was in any other nation. He was more present in Jerusalem than he was in any other city in Israel. He was more present in the temple than he was in any other place in Jerusalem. And he was more present in the most holy place or the holy of holies than he was in any other place in the temple. And so when we speak about the presence of God, we're speaking about God's disclosure of himself, his self-disclosure to his people for his glory and for their blessing. We're speaking about God's self-disclosure of himself to his people for his glory and their blessing. And we see this idea of God's presence in this way throughout the Bible. So the great blessing of Eden was the presence of God. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, Genesis 3.8 says that they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. When Moses intercedes for Israel at Sinai in Exodus 33, verse 14, God gives him this promise. God says to Moses, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And then Moses replied, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. So Moses is saying, Lord, if you're not going to go with us, we don't even, we, we just leave us right here where we are. When the psalmist is repenting for his sin against the Lord, he says, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. And when we think about moving on into the New Testament, this idea of the the presence of God is a continual theme there as well. The the very church of God is is pictured as a temple uh, where God's presence is. God's people, ourselves, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. That is God dwelling with his people uh, so that we may experience his presence. The hope for believers after death in 2 Corinthians 4.14, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. And then the punishment of those who have not trusted in Christ, 2 Thessalonians 1.9 says, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his might. And At the same time, it says of the the unrepentant that they will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So the Bible is clear that God can be present both to bless and he can be present to punish. But what we as believers rejoice in is that God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so at the end of the Bible in the the consummation of all things, we see in Revelation 7, 15, therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. He will shelter us with his presence. What a glorious promise that is. In the new heavens and new earth, Revelation 21, 3, At the consummation of all things, it says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. I will be their God. They will be my people. That is a theme that runs all the way through Scripture. And so this is what the entire history of redemption has been building up to, the people of God experiencing the presence of God immediately by sight. But now, those of you who lead God's people in singing his praises, you are serving them by helping them to experience God's presence by faith. 
First Chronicles 16.11 says, Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Those of us who lead have the, have the privilege of helping God's people to, to seek his presence continually. Psalm 95 verse 2, Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. And so as we think about Psalm 16, while Psalm 16 was written by an individual, we know that the psalms were meant to be sung corporately. And so the psalms have often been referred to as the divinely inspired hymn book of the church. And I think there's many principles that we can take from Psalm 16 regarding our corporate gatherings. Uh, And so like a good Calvinist, I have five points here. Point number one, God is present through prayer. God is present with his people through prayer. Point number two, God is present with his people or through his people. Point three, God is present through his word. Point four, God is present through the gospel. And then point five is Joy is the indisputable fruit of the presence of God. Joy is the indisputable fruit of the presence of God. First, God is present through prayer. Look again at verse 1. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. This psalm begins with a prayer of praise and adoration to God. Prayer should play a key role as we gather. And different churches have different practices. So in some churches, the elders are the only ones who pray publicly. In other churches, it may be common for people who are on the music team to close a song with a prayer. And if that's you, if you have that opportunity to to pray publicly with the people of God, I just want to encourage you to seize those moments. Those are precious, precious moments. What an opportunity to call out to God publicly on behalf of his people. Those moments should not be wasted. And a few things we just want to notice about this prayer. First, it is a theologically informed prayer. It's a theologically informed prayer. He says, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Lord, capital L-O-R-D. That's the covenant name for God. That's the special name that God revealed to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus 3. That is covenant theology. That's a theologically informed prayer. When we lead people in public prayer, we shouldn't do so in a way that paints a fuzzy or ambiguous picture of who God is. Right? And so, so you know, at, at times I've been in gatherings where I've, you know, well-meaning saints have prayed things like, Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for dying on the cross for our sins, Father. And when you hear that, and I hear that, I'm like, well, I know what you mean, but... It's Jesus who died, so it's the Son who died on the cross. The Father did not die on the cross. The Father sent his Son to die on the cross. And that's not just theological nitpicking, but what, but what that is is it's, we, we, we want to speak truthfully about God and to God when we lead people because when we lead people publicly, that's, that's, there's a teaching function that's actually happening in those moments. We're, we're teaching people how to engage with God the Lord. At the same time, it's possible to have all of our theological I's dotted and T's crossed and yet be cold and lifeless in how we pray. So we want to avoid that extreme as well. One thing that will help us with that is simply remembering who it is that we are praying to. Notice that as David prays that there's continuity here. He's not just coming up with a new thing. He's not trying to be innovative in how he refers to God. He's referring to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Moses. He says, you are my Lord. That's my Adonai, my sovereign one. This is big God theology right here. So this is a theologically informed prayer. It's also a dependent prayer. It's a dependent prayer. 
He says, preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I have no good apart from you. This is the psalmist recognizing his absolute need for God, that apart from God he can do absolutely nothing and he has no good at all. It's a dependent prayer. Preserve me, O God, implying that if God does not preserve him, he will be lost. He will suffer um, greatly um, at the hands of his enemies. So it's a dependent prayer. Notice also that it's a brief prayer, right? <laughs> that's, and I think that's noteworthy. It's just a few sentences translated in English, and yet it says so much. We must remember that we are not heard for our many words. And so we shouldn't, in the name of being theologically informed, feel like we have to recite a systematic theology every single time that we pray. This is a brief prayer. Now, that doesn't mean that there won't be times of extended prayer, but economy of language is a good thing. Praise God for economy of language. So God is present with his people through prayer. God is also present through his people. Look at verse 3. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. In the text here, the excellent ones that may be translated noble or wonderful or magnificent. The people of God are one of the ways that God shows himself to us. It's often, especially these days, for people to publicly have low views of the church. You know, people constantly complaining about Christians, complaining about the church. But we should be mindful that the Scripture uses such exalted language to talk about the people of God. The people of God are referred to in 1 Peter 2.9 as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Colossians 3.12 refers to the people of God as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. It's important for us to think this way about the people that we are serving. So <laughs> it's probably not going to be helpful as we're leading to be thinking things like, oh, there's Miss Kathy in the front row. What's she going to be complaining about after the service? Right? It's probably not going to help us to serve them if we're thinking things like that. Or, oh, there's Mr. Johnson again, stone-faced as usual. Right? It's probably not going to help us <laughs> to serve them if we're thinking things like that. No, we want to remind ourselves by faith that these are God's chosen ones. They are holy and beloved. And, and what a privilege I get to sing God's praises amongst a group of royal priests. Is that the way you see the brother or sister next to you? The brother or sister next to you is a Christian. They are a royal priest, chosen, precious, holy, beloved by God. We have to keep this in mind. God is present through his people. God is also present through his word. Look down at verse 7. It says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also, my heart instructs me. I believe that when it says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel, that is a reference to the Word of God. And the reason I believe that is because when you look at Psalm 1, when it says, blessed are those who walk not in the counsel of the wicked, that counsel of the wicked is contrasted with delighting in the law of the Lord and on his law meditating day and night. So the counsel of the wicked is contrasted with the law of the Lord or the word of the Lord. In Psalm 119, verse 24, speaking of God's word, he says, your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. So I think this, this reference here is a reference to the word of God. God is pleased to meet with his people through the, the reading, the understanding, the reciting, and the proclamation of his word. I love this text from uh, 1 Samuel 3, verse 21, where it says, The Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. <laughs> 
The Lord appeared by his word. And that is what God does in our midst as we embrace him by faith for all that he is for us in Christ and through the gospel. And so I think one of of the things that's just very practical for us is that it helps to connect the songs that we sing to the scriptures that they're based on, right? So it, it, it's very helpful so that we, we don't think that we're just kind of, kind of just coming up with things on our own or, 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 you know, singing these songs that have no connection at all to the word. But no, they, 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 we should be singing scripture-based songs and we should be able to trace back where we find the, the ideas that are in the songs in the Bible, uh, I, I remember at a, a gathering a few years back where we sang before the throne of God above, and, and just before we sang that song, there was a, there was a reading from Zechariah chapter 3, and I'm just going to just read the first few, few verses of Zechariah chapter 3. It says, then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, rebuke, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. So just having that passage read before we sang the song, it gave a fresh meaning to when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. It was drawing that connection from the song to God's Word. In song selection, if you're involved with that, it's helpful to to look at the lyrics and be able to point where that particular truth or idea is found in Scripture. That's just a helpful practice, and it can can keep us from going off the rails in, um, in bad directions. So God is present with His people through His Word. God is also present through the gospel. Look at verse 10. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. This is a verse that is pregnant with gospel meaning. In fact, this verse is quoted many times in the New Testament. So over in uh, the book of Acts chapter 2, uh, it's quoted by the Apostle Peter in t- Acts 2.22. It says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord, and then he quotes from Psalm 16, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You've made known to me the paths of life, you make me full of gladness with your presence. And then the Apostle Peter gives the, the explanation of this text, and, he, and he, he applies it, and he says, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. But there being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. So the the New Testament 
writers, apostles, inspired by the Holy Spirit, they look back at this text from Psalm 1610 and say, this is Jesus. This is Jesus speaking. This goes beyond the person of David to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is speaking about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 13, verse 35, he also quotes this passage. He says, it says in the psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. And then the Apostle Paul begins to comment on this text, and he says, For David, as after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. So the apostles, when they looked at this passage from Psalm 16, they said, this is pointing to Jesus. This is pointing to his glorious resurrection and offering of forgiveness through the gospel. I think this means that, obviously, that the gospel should be central in our gatherings and that as we lead the people of God, that it, 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 should, it should always be infused and sat, saturated with the gospel. If it's not, what are we even doing, <laughs> right? Like, what is the point of even being there if, it's, if the gospel is not the main focus? God, amen. God has set it up so that everything would highlight <laughs> the gospel. You just think about the things that God commands amongst his gathered people. He commands the Lord's Supper to, to be a regular activity. What is the Lord's Supper but a proclamation of the Lord's death until he returns? He commands that baptism be something that is regularly practiced by his church until he returns. What is baptism but a picture of the death and burial of God's people with, with the Lord Jesus Christ in union with Christ? God commands that the word of God be preached regularly in his church until Christ returns. What is the preached word about if, if it's not about the gospel? Right? If we're not preaching the gospel regularly, then we're not, we're not accurately preaching God's word. You think about even prayer, right? When we pray, we close our prayers in Jesus' name. <laughs> but when we say in Jesus' name, that is not just something that we just throw on as a tagline at the end of our prayers, but there's rich meaning in that because we're acknowledging something. When we pray in Jesus' name, what we're saying is, I'm not coming to you in my name, <laughs> Right? I'm not coming into you in my name because I don't deserve to come before you because of my sin. In fact, I don't deserve to have any prayers answered ever because of my sin. But I'm coming to you in the name of another, in Jesus' name, because Jesus deserves everything. And so, therefore, I, being united with Christ, have the privilege of approaching a holy God in his name. That is, and, and, and why are we able to do that? It's only because of the gospel, right? It's because our sins have been forgiven through Christ that now we can approach God. So, so let, the, let the, the, the gospel be the, the regular, steady thing that is pointed to as, the, as you lead, as you serve the people of God in singing God's praises. And finally, a joy is the indisputable fruit of the presence of God. Verse 11, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. We have to be impressed with how often this theme of, of joy presents itself in Psalm 16. Did you, did you notice all of, the, all of the different words that indicate joy or delight? We see, we see delight in verse 3, right? The saints in whom is all my delight. We see uh, pleasant places and beautiful inheritance in verse 6. He says that my whole heart is glad, my whole being rejoices, Right? And then as we just saw, we saw the fullness of joy. We saw pleasures forever. So, so pleasant, beautiful, rejoice, gladness, joy. That, that is the theme of this song. And so, so as, we, as we think about 
that we, we, we consider that where the presence of God is, that produces joy amongst his people. Where his presence is there to bless, that produces joy amongst the people of God. And so in many ways, as those who lead in uh, singing of God's praises, you are joy facilitators, right? You're joy facilitators. You're helping God's people to connect with him to the end that he might be glorified in their joy <laughs> in him. It's a weighty responsibility. It's a, it's a privilege to be able to do this. So, so just, a, just a couple of points of application as we think about that joy being the indisputable fruit of the presence of God. Number one, let us rejoice in God ourselves privately before leading others publicly. Let us rejoice in God ourselves privately before leading others publicly. Because I don't think any, any, any of us wants to be hypocrites, right? So we don't, we don't want to participate in hypocrisy. But if we're not careful, we can easily do that, right? So if we neglect, um, you know, communing with God through his word, through prayer, through, uh, through song throughout the week, we can come on Sundays and be tempted to just fake it, right? To just, you know, to not have actual joy, but to have manufactured joy. Um, and, and we know that, that God, the man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart, right? So, so God knows exactly what's going on in, uh, in our hearts. And, and so what we want to do is make sure that Sundays are just an overflow of what it is that we've been doing throughout the week, right? Sunday should not be the only time that we're connecting with God, but it should be just like we've been engaging with the Lord regularly, and then Sunday is just the overflow of that. The, the, the people that we serve will be served better if that is the case. Rejoicing God ourselves privately before leading others publicly. Number two, engage with God as you lead. Engage with God yourself as you lead. So often um, when we're leading uh, God's people and singing his praises, it can, we can be so focused on the technical aspects of getting everything right. So whether that's from a musician standpoint, making sure you got the, got the music down, you're hitting the right notes. Uh, from a singing standpoint, making sure the harmonies are right. We can get so caught up in all of that that we forget that we're supposed to be engaging with God ourselves. And it actually, it actually makes a difference whether or not we do this. So I know for me, when, whenever I'm in the congregation, it is just a great encouragement to see those who are leading in the singing to be engaging with the Lord themselves. I'll never forget the first time that um, I was at a, a conference and uh, there was a team who was leading in the singing. And, and for some reason, I was, I was on the side uh, of closest so that in my vision I could see the drummer. So the drummer was just like right there. And so I'm, I'm used to drummers being like the coolest dudes in the room and like, like they just kind, of just kind of just unaffected, just kind of doing their thing and just like, but when I saw this particular drummer, he, was, he wasn't just kind of doing his thing, but he was also, he was singing he was engaging with the Lord, so I, I saw him, him, him singing the words to the song, and that was just, that was just super encouraging. I was like, yo, this, this dude is engaging with the Lord, and that makes me want to engage with the Lord even more, just to be able to see that. When, when you are up in front of people, people notice everything, <laughs> everything. So just to, you just move your hair like that, everybody notices it, right? You scratch your nose, everybody sees that, right? And, and that's not meant to cripple us <laughs> with fear, like, oh, they're all watching me, right? Um, but we need to know that we're, we're modeling something for people and that it will encourage them more when we are engaged with God ourselves. And, and that's not something that we can produce on our own. That's something we need to pray to God and ask him, Lord, would you, would you help us as we lead your people this morning to be engaging with you ourselves, Right? Engage with God as you lead. And then the um, last thing I would just want to mention here is that remember that this is just preparation for heaven. 
This is, that's right, this is a rehearsal. This is a dress rehearsal for heaven. What are we going to be doing in heaven? (laughs) We're going to spend an eternity singing God's praises. So what we're doing on Sundays in many ways is a warm-up. It is a rehearsal. And here's the thing about heaven. In heaven, it won't be us who are the primary leaders of the congregation, but it will be the Lord Jesus himself who is leading the congregation in the praises of God. I'm so fascinated by this verse from Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12, which is quoting from Psalm 22, verse 22, which says, and this this is the Lord Jesus, so this is what the Lord Jesus is saying. He says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. So this is a picture of the risen Lord in heaven with all of the redeemed, glorified saints, blood-bought saints with him. And Jesus is the one who is lead. He's the ultimate worship leader. That's where everything is pointing towards ultimately. And so, so let us, as we lead God's people, let let us us always keep our eyes on what is to come. And what is to come is that this, what we're experiencing now is just a a faint echo, but it's real, right? So so it's it's, it's very real, but but it's faint in terms of what it's actually going to be. But it's a faint echo of what we're going to be doing in glorified bodies with glorified affections and glorified minds for all eternity. And, and let that um, humble us and let it cause us to um, rejoice as we uh, lead the people of God. Amen? Amen. So with that said, I'm going to pray and then we'll, um, we'll open it up for any questions. We have about five minutes for uh, possible questions. Let's pray. Uh, Father, you are so good to us. We we truly have no good apart from you. And I thank you for these brothers and sisters. And uh, and thank you for the the privilege that we have of coming together and serving your people through leading them um, in in proclaiming your excellencies. Would you uh, would you help us to? Uh, to seek your strength and your presence continually, uh, both in our private lives and amongst your people? And, um, and would you help us to uh, keep our eyes on that day which is coming when the Lord Jesus himself will, will lead us around the throne? We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.